It is my huge pleasure today to be able to have a chance to talk to James Cameron. He is uh, the most successful director and movie maker of all time. You can measure that a lot of different ways, but uh, James uh, has uh, generated an enormous amount of wealth in movies, uh, some the top earning films of all time. But maybe more importantly for that is uh, multiple Oscars. But to me, uh, billions of lives. James' thoughts have been broadcast into the minds and inspiration and, and imaginations of billions of people around the world. Maybe the greatest measure of a filmmaker. Uh, Jim is Canadian. He's born in Kapuskasing and uh, grew up near Niagara Falls, a little town called Chippewa. And he's a National Geographic uh, Explorer in residence. Uh, three of the biggest films he's made uh, are Terminator, which was the one that really broke it big for him. Um, Titanic, uh, just an absolute legendary film. And those two films were selected to be in the US National Film Repository just for their cultural and historical significance. And then of course, Avatar, which he uh, wrote and directed and produced and even helped edit. So an amazing hands-on uh, global success in that area. Uh, he has been to the deepest part of the ocean, the, the, the closest to the center of the world that any individual human being has been at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. And um, he's very involved in uh, global issues, dealing with some of the problems that are facing us at a personal level, dealing with COVID and, and the pandemic, but also looking at uh, other global problems like climate change and what personal and professional choices he can make both as a private citizen, but also uh, as a public figure. So uh, joining us from Wellington, New Zealand today <laughs> is uh, my friend and a man I respect greatly, uh, James Cameron. How are you, Jim? I'm good. I, I have to tell you uh, how surreal it is to hear my CV recited by one of uh, <laughs> Canada's great legendary Le legendary heroes uh, himself, you know, uh, Chris, you've uh, you've been in space on multiple missions and you're one of the people that I admire the most. So it's a bit surreal to have all the things I've done uh, recited by you. But uh, <laughs> what a great way to what a great way to wake up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's morning in Wellington uh, there where you're filming Avatar 2 and 3, of course. But you know, there was a moment in time where I was in space uh, and and you were getting ready or had just gone to the deepest portion of the earth. I would have loved it mm -hmm. if uh, if we could have had this yeah. same conversation with me outside on that spacewalk. And, and I, I don't know what our uh, internet connection is going to be like today, but, but uh, hopefully it'll be better than that one would have been. But it leads me to my first question for you, James, and that is, uh, I, I don't know when, when you learned to scuba dive, but at... In, in 95, I think it was, 1995, the same year as my first space flight, you for the very first time had a chance to go see Titanic on the bottom of the yeah. Atlantic with your yeah, own correct. eyes. What, what um, you know, 1500 people died on that ship, but what, what did that mean to you? What did it look like to see it for real for the first time in your life? Well, it was interesting. I went, um, I tried to have an astronaut mentality when I went to Titanic. I went there to accomplish a specific mission, which was to film it for a movie. That was my kind of self-appointed task that I had sold to the, to the movie studio, to 20th Century Fox. So I went there bristling with equipment, with lights, with, with vehicles that could be dropped independently and picked up by the sub and would provide additional lighting and, uh, robotic, a robotic vehicle and, uh, uh, an unprecedented underwater movie camera that could be outside the sub and could be panned and tilted around. So we had been prepping for this for about, I would say, 10 months. And I had built a big model of the ship and I used it to work with the Russian sub pilots to plan every move. So when I first got there, I was thinking mission. I was thinking, I'm here to do a task. Yes, the wreck looks as described. I'd studied it. And it wasn't until I finished that first dive and I came back to the ship and I had a moment in the evening just by myself and I realized I had just been looking at the decks where people were loaded into the lifeboats or where many perished. As you said, 1,500 people died. I had sat in a sub 
on the deck of the ship at the exact spot that the band had played, that the or ship's oh, orchestra wow. had played, famously to play to keep the passengers calm. And it just hit me like a flood that I had created a barrier um, against the emotional reaction to the wreck and to the event. And that as a filmmaker, I had to let that in. I had to let that be forefront in my consciousness with everything I did there at the site and then everything I did in the movie later. So I think as a result of that kind of epiphany, the movie was much more emotional uh, than if I had just proceeded in that very linear uh, Cartesian way to, uh, to hmm. just get the job done there. Yeah, it's kind of like a, almost a juxtaposition of where the technology allows you to see something or do something like my spacewalk or, or you seeing Titanic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you have to focus on the technology and maybe you can't even get yourself properly ready for what that's going to mean to you personally. You know, how are you going to internalize that? Oh. So wonderful that you could put it into the movie. Yeah. And, and, you know, the thing is that I, I've done a fair bit of study of how space missions are done and, and almost they're itemized to the minute. Every task is, is accounted for in advance. And then there are, you know, contingency pathways in case you can't get everything done or whatever. And you must have found that with your EVA as well. But they really need to put a line item into the, the mission to the mission schedule that says stop and be there. Just be there. Yeah, Five I, minutes. Allowed. As, you know, they don't do that. Do, do they? <laughs> they sure don't. As the director that with your cast at some point, do you say, hey, let's all just notice where we are? Yeah, exactly. And let's notice where we are emotionally. You know, I mean, it's always, it's always important to do that. So I literally, when I, when I planned every night before I'd make a submersible dive, I always write out exactly what my tasks are minute by minute and, and never more so than when I made the dive into Challenger Deep. And I had every minute accounted for and all my tasks that were ordered, you know, according to depth and position and all that sort of thing. It was about eight pages long. I took that in the sub with me and I worked from that. Uh, again, inspired by the sort of NASA approach. Um, but I literally wrote down, stop and smell the roses. Just stop and huh. be there. And when I had wow. accomplished my initial task, when I reached the bottom, I'd reported my depth and my position and I told everybody the systems on the sub were fine and reported in the life support. And the next line item was just stop and be there. And think, yeah. think about where, think about where you are. Think about where your technology and your planning has taken you. And you were, gosh, uh, five miles or a little more underneath the surface. What was it? Was it cold? What was the actual environment around you when you were at that deepest point of the world alone? Well, it's closer to seven miles is 35, uh, almost 36,000 feet. And, um, from the time you reach past the uh, past about 500 feet of depth, which is not very much, it's pretty much pitch black. So you've been in a, uh, an environment of total darkness outside the sub for most of the descent, for the great majority of the descent. Um, and by the time you get about 1,000, 1,500 feet down, the outside water temperature is only de a degree or so above freezing. So you, the sphere that you're in, the sub looks like a torpedo, but embedded within it is a sphere. And that sphere is keeping out the external pressure because that's nature's most elegant shape uh, yeah. for dealing with pressure, either internal or external. And um, so the sphere, which is about three inches thick steel, is starting to cold soak. And that cold permeates inside the sub. So for the great majority of your descent, um, you're physically in contact with a fr uh, literally freezing steel sphere, which is why you put on the little beanie cap because otherwise you get a frozen frostbite patch yeah. like a yamulka, you know, on the back of your <laughs> head uh, and your feet, uh, you know, are up against the hatch. You know, you're kind of scrunched into this thing. It's not very, not very spacious. Uh, so it's cold. And so initially the heat from the electronics keeps the air relatively warm, but the, the, um, uh, the steel sphere itself gets pretty dang cold. So you just have to sort of harden your mind 
against that and that that's going to be a discomfort. There's obviously the, I don't get claustrophobia, so being in a small space doesn't bother me. But eventually my joints say, hey, buddy, you know, <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> stretched. We haven't, we, haven't, yeah. we haven't moved much uh, here in the last six hours. <laughs> yeah. So you're just going back to where all that could have come from. I mean, you're a little kid from from a small town in Kapuskasing yeah. and, and then near Niagara yeah. Falls. But I understand your mom was both a nurse and an artist and your dad, electrical engineer. That's almost a yeah. little uh, a little vignette of, of the way that you've approached life, the, the hard technical side and then the, the human and the artistic side. Do you think their professions influenced you or is it just, just who you are? I think it's probably more who you are, but there is a certain element of, of nurture that goes with that, that sort of biological mandate. So I'm assuming that I got an equal distribution of genes from both of them. And my, my father yeah. is very analytical and logical uh, and funny. He's surprisingly, he's the one with the sense of humor more so than my, yeah. than my mom. My mom, obviously more sensitive and artistic. And so I must have gotten a blend of those genes and gotten a blend of that in the in the upbringing process as well. I obviously got the work ethic from my, my dad. He's a very disciplinarian and organized uh, and very prepared. You know, they say fortune favors the prepared mind, but I was always taught to be prepared for every situation. Uh, so I think it's a combination of your, your parents, your environment as you grew up, and uh, and just who you are, the genetic throw of the dice, I guess. Um, I can draw a line back through all the things I've done, back to the things I did as a kid. I was always building things. I was always out in the woods exploring, trying to see, going farther and farther, trying to see what was out there, bringing back samples, you know, whether it was salamanders and frogs, snakes or whatever I could find and organizing them and describing them and capturing butterflies. And, you know, so I, I look at that and I say, well, isn't that all just exploration? Isn't that all science? You know, just coming at it innately and, and loving it and being passionate about it. And you moved from, uh, I mean, you were, what, 17, I think, or so when you moved from uh, small town Canada to California. To me, when I was 17, you know, especially in the winter time in Ontario, it would have been like uh, like some sort of lottery dream to to move to Southern California. Yeah. Was it exciting at the time? Was it just a family move? You got a few uh, siblings, right? Yeah, it's a it's a family of five kids, and we all moved out to California. Uh, and you're right, I was 17, and it was right at the cusp between high high school and uh, and college. Uh, so, you know, a time of changes, a time of upheaval. And I think that's good, too, in a person's life. You don't want to get too comfortable. You don't want to get too set in your ways. You don't want to feel too based in one place. Um, those things may, might tend to, to hold you back. And so I realized, hey, now I'm in, now I'm in California. Maybe where will I go next? What will I do next? It was a time of, I would say, anxiety about what I was going to, you know, dedicate my life to, like you can even make that decision when you're, when you're 17. But, uh, you know, I, I just basically went to college and I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. It never rains here. <laughs> it's always warm. <laughs> I like, yeah. I like California. I like California. <laughs> you know, I think I started to yeah. uh, grow socially for the first time then. I was pretty nerdy when I was in high school in Canada, I was pretty absorbed in my own stuff, which was artistic drawing and painting and, and uh, being the head of the science club newly formed by me at a very jockey <laughs> high school. So I think the club's maximum membership consisted of me and one girl from Czechoslovakia who didn't speak English. <laughs> and where is she now? <laughs> I don't know, I'd like to find out. <laughs> Yeah, I lived, I was a test pilot uh, up in the desert in California. And I remember uh, my first uh -huh. morning there, I opened the bedroom window and going, hey, it's a beautiful sunny day. That's great. And then the next day, hey, yeah. it's a beautiful. And after about a week, I went, oh, okay. It's always a beautiful sunny uh, day. It's you steady, need to get used it's to steady that state. Yeah, so you were at yeah. Edwards then. Yeah, I was a test. I went through test pilot school with the U.S. Air Force at Edwards and then was a test pilot with the Navy in Patuxent River. So I, I spent one year in California. But... I've heard it said that the, the the sort of the genesis for Terminator came to you in a, in a dream. 
And you, you just talked about as a kid coming out of 17, 18, 19, thinking about what to do next. How, I have trouble remembering my dreams and, and, I, and sometimes I just discount them. Do you, do you really listen to your dreams and how do you, how do you physically remember what you've dreamed? For me, dreaming is, is my own sort of private Netflix. That's just a streaming. Huh. It's just a streaming station. That's just there for me. And uh, it's on every night. And you never know what you're going to get. And they're often incredibly surreal and random, but they have bits and fragments of story DNA in them. I, I think the, 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 a dream is the brain just running, running its own internal processes and relating things and, and taking memories and sort of mashing them up. I don't think anybody's adequately described what dreaming is. Uh, in my case, they're, they're usually pretty vivid and pretty surreal. Uh, and often I'll, I'll wake up and I'll, I'll remember images or bits of, uh, bits of story. And sometimes I'll even write them down. And so I definitely get a lot of inspiration from dreams. Do you think it helps? I mean, the, the skills that you have as an artist and, and as a, as a model maker, do, do you record your dreams visually like that? I mean, I sometimes think of lyrics to a song or something and, and I'll, I'll uh -huh. write them down. I've never recorded something in, in, a, in a drawing or in a model. Or how do you keep track of the things you're dreaming of? Well, here's a good example, I guess. So, you know, Avatar, one of the key visual elements in the movie Avatar is this bioluminescent forest where the ground glows and, and uh, activates when you step on it. And um, there are big trees that look kind of like fiber optic lamps and so on. Yeah. Um, so I had a dream. I had a dream when I was in college. I would have been about 19. And it was so vivid that I was in this sort of bioluminescent world that I got up and I grabbed a piece of black paper and I sketched on it in uh, colored uh, Prismacolor pencils, which was a technique I used at the time. And I basically sketched it all out. Um, and that was part of the inspiration for Avatar. I initially, in the mid 70s, I incorporated that concept into the first screenplay that I wrote. And it was a bioluminescent world and some astronauts went there and it was all very beautiful, but it came from that, that dream. And then later when I went to write mm -hmm. Avatar about 20, years, about 20 years later, I just went back to that concept and incorporated it into the fabric of the world. So I think you do build uh, over time, you create this kind of library of images and story, story fragments and ideas in your mind. And then it just becomes associative after that. Maybe there's a thing that drives you to creating a certain project, but then you start to draw on all these things that you've sort of stuffed away on mental shelves over the years. It doesn't just come fully, you know, realized out of nowhere. It's, it's definitely drawing on all the things that you've imagined or thought of, or maybe things that you've read and been inspired by. Um, and yeah. sometimes they merge together and you forget what is yours and what is Arthur C. Clarke's or Ray Bradbury's or something like that. It's good right. to keep your references straight. So you're not, you don't become a plagiarist. <laughs> and and that's like building a big pyramid of your own experiences in life so that maybe you can have a peek at the end to do something. But, but on the flip side of that, you've done some really dangerous things, you know, uh, not yeah, just yeah. uh, marrying us trench, but huge personal risk, uh, a financial risk, a big change of life. And uh, you're obviously got a, a goal that you're trying to accomplish. Like you're trying to solve some sort of mystery in your life, but how do you weigh out? What am I going to be willing to take a risk at? Well, how do I evaluate from yeah. this big pyramid of life experience? What am I going to do next? How, how do you go through that? Well, two things. I mean, at first, I, I just want to, I just want to run with your pyramid metaphor. I think that that's, that's a good way to look at it. You're always sitting at the apex of that pyramid every single day, no matter what you do, every corner you turn, every person you meet, you're sitting at the apex of all that knowledge and information and experience and all the ideas and thoughts that you've ever had always come up to that, to the, to the diamond point of that moment that you're in at any given time. And I kind of like that about life. I, I always say, uh, you know, I like new encounters because I never know what I'm going to say. 
uh, because you can't really sit and assess that entire pyramid all at once and ever really know how it's going to impact what you do next until you've done it. So to me, it's kind of like life is kind of like watching a movie and not knowing what's going to happen next. I kind of like that about it. You know, uh, in terms of risk, uh, yeah, you always have to to weigh the 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 good or the gain against the risk factors. So a project can be risky. Any project it can either be physically risky, or it can be financially risky. It can be creatively risky. Uh, you can do risky things as an artist that could you could lose your you know fan base or you know the people that have enjoyed your work to date could be you could do something that's a swerve for them that they don't they don't go with you did i really expect my fans from terminator and aliens to suddenly be interested in a movie with a bunch of big hats and corsets and and that took took place in in the edwardian era no but that didn't stop me from from doing it cuz i was interested in it um, i think ultimately it boils down to what where your own interests drive you and then carefully calculate that risk, especially when, when physical risk is involved, both for yourself and other people. Uh, my, my attitude on an expedition, on a deep ocean expedition, is that the guys that are in the water hooking up the sub and trying to get it out of the water are on deck with cables that are under high tension that if they broke away could, could cut your leg off. Uh, or doing boat transfers, you know, in and out of the, the water in, in unpredictable sea conditions, they're as at risk as I am. So if we choose to go out there, um, and I'm going to put myself in a, in a, uh, a piloted submersible and dive down thousands of feet or tens of thousands of feet, um, we're all at risk. And by the way, you're just at risk being at sea. You can get caught in a hurricane, sure. you can get caught in a storm, there could be other kinds of failures. So you have to weigh this risk against the upside. And in my case, the up, I've always tried to have a twofold upside with these expeditions, which is both science and uh, art, in the sense that we'll bring back a film and we'll share the knowledge about the places that we've been, we'll bring back the images, and that inspires people to think scientifically and to think in terms of technology. And maybe if it's young people, they can think in terms of what does STEM mean to me? What does science, technology, engineering, math mean to me? You know, maybe they'll make that connection. And I don't think 100% or even 50% of an audience watching one of my documentaries might make that connection, but some will. And they'll go yeah. into engineering or they'll, or they'll be inspired to do their own explorations. So that's, in my mind, innately worth it. And to me, the big challenge, the thing that sort of gets me up early in the morning or thinking about things late at night is how to mitigate that risk, how to manage against the risk, how to yeah. engineer against the risk. To me, the, the uh, most, a lot of the fun of an expedition is the six months or the eight months or 10 months you spend beforehand trying to think of <laughs> every single thing that could go wrong and yeah. engineer against that or create procedures against that. So I, I, I think you can see that I've been inspired by the sort of NASA approach. And I was quite struck. <laughs> Very about, much, yeah. Well, I know I am. I think it's a way to get things done. I think it's a way to to reduce the variables down to uh, just a few. If, if, it's, if you get taken down by something that nobody ever predicted, you kind of don't feel like such a jackass as if, oh man, I remember when we all sat around and talked about this <laughs> and now it's actually <laughs> happening because we didn't, we didn't yeah. take the threat seriously enough, you know, but I think, you know, I was struck because um, I was actually on the NASA advisory council for a couple of years Yeah, and I was, struck. they have a risk curve. I'm sure you're very familiar with this on the Y axis. There's the, the consequence of the event and on the X axis is the likelihood of the event. So yeah. you, Probability. So you have the, the thing that they always that that they plot all the way out at the end of the X and Y curve is the is the least likely greatest consequence event. And for in the space shuttle program, that was total loss of crew. So total loss of yeah. crew plotted at a certain point up on the uh, upper right. And then everything in between, there was a line that was drawn between that and the zero. Right. So. So there were things that were likely to happen that had very low consequence. 
and everything had to plot below that line for them to proceed. Yeah. It was kind of very simple. If something was going to happen a lot, but it only cost you 10 minutes a day on a mission and that plotted below the line, it was an acceptable risk. And yeah. you take that all the way out to the end where, where you get to total loss of vehicle and crew. But if it only happens once every hundred missions, that's where you define it. Cause you've got to put that risk factor somewhere. You've got to put it somewhere and you've got to be mindful of it. Um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that with my expeditions, I ever had enough information at the beginning to even plot where things were going to, were going to fall yeah. on the curve. You know, I didn't have enough data. Yeah. So that's where a people bit of ask astronauts. Yeah. People ask astronauts and they must ask you uh, also, uh, you know, is it scary? That must be a scary thing to do. And in, in because I followed that same philosophy that you just described, it occurred to me several years ago that there's a difference between danger and risk and, and fear, and they don't have to be synonymous. You know, things aren't really scary, just sometimes people are scared. And if you're ready, you're not as scared. But it, it does put in the back of my mind, and I'm interested to hear your answer, um, what scares you right now? I mean, what what at this stage of your life, with the tremendous uh, resounding successes you've had and the, and the extremely interesting personal experiences and the amount of preparation you do for the risks you face, what, uh, what scares you? You know, it's interesting. I think a lot of my, my fears, my deep fears are kind of existential in the sense that I fear for where we're going. I fear that hmm. we are... Uh, we are possibly going to throw away the upside value of this great experiment in human intelligence. We're, we're busily dismantling a lot of the upside value of this human experiment in democracy. Uh, so, and, but I just see us wasting our intelligence. We're turning our backs on science. We're embracing, and I say the collective we, we're embracing magical thinking. Um, you know, we're we're not being the creatures we all imagined ourselves to be, and at the same time, we're we're burdening our planet with the the almost complete destruction of its habitat and and all of its uh, the great diversity and wonder of life, so that we can maintain this civilization that isn't isn't paying off. That's what I look at. That that's my great fear is that we're about to enter a dark age and give up all that we've we've lost. I mean, I think on a personal level, my my fears are more for my family, and I think that's very acute uh, when you see the effect of a pandemic and how it can uh, you know disrupt and destabilize. And, uh, and you, you, you still know, have so, children at home, right? You still have children yeah, I at have home? Yeah, I still have, I have two that are out and three that are still at home. Uh, they range from 13 to 30 at this point. But um, yeah, so I mean, I think from a family perspective, I think every, every father uh, feels a fear that something could happen to his family, to his wife, to his children. More, much more so, I think, than fear for one's own survival. Uh, I think I would I would fear for my health only because I would be unable to to mitigate those uh, risks for my family. It's things like that. Uh, so for me, the the fear can be on a a philosophical level, fearing for the future, fearing for the future of our world and our our place in it, and it can be on a personal level. Uh, but for me, it's all about others. In terms of at sixty six, with all the crazy stuff that I've done in my life, I don't fear death. And ha that much. happy, uh, happy birthday, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you know, I always say that you know you get to a certain age where you'd kind of just rather not have the birthday, but then on the other hand, <laughs> the alternative the alternative is not yeah. so good either. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, the, the scariest moment in my life, people ask me, and I, I thought about it. And, and it's, as you say, it's the things that you can't prepare for that have to do with your family. And my son was just in grade one, I think, and he had to wait for the school bus. We walked out to the end of the driveway and the school bus was coming and he had to cross a busy road and the bus would stop and the lights would flash and the cars would you know stop on either side. And I, I, you know, I was talking to him about it. He was about six and he didn't hear me right. And he suddenly just started running across the road because he thought I'd said, go Whoa. now. And I didn't know whether to yell for him to stop because there were cars and he was already partway across. And, and 
and it was it was the most terrifying, petrifying. And you sure. know, I've flown three rocket ships and done spacewalks and yeah, yeah, things, yeah. but for me, yeah. that that personal family uh, risk was, was the fear. How do you? I mean, the demands of your job take you like like you're in months and months. How do you stay close to you know your your parents and your and your children at all the different stages of your life? Is there a way that people can learn from you as to how to try and balance that? I don't know if you'd want to learn from me. In my early days, I, I basically just sort of turned my back on my family and set sail and didn't feel that strong sense of bond. And it, I didn't let it hold me back. It was it was not part of the escape velocity that I had to create for myself. Um, but eventually, you know, as I became a father and I started to realize how important family is to people, whether they admit it to themselves or not, uh, I made sure that I made time. Now, I'm sure that my kids could all write books about about how their dad <laughs> took off and made movies all the time and all that. But uh, I think it's it, it's um, I think no one in my family would deny that a lot of a lot of time has been made to, to create a close bond with the core family over the last, let's call it 10 years. Um, and yeah, I think you have to factor it in. You have to factor it into the type of work that you take on. But on the other hand, you can't let it stop you. You know, you have to, you have to be of two minds at the same time. There has to be the part of your mind that also says, I need to go do this thing. And, uh, you know, I was a father of five kids when I decided to, to build that sub and uh, spend many thousands of hours perfecting the engineering on it and then get into it and dive it. Yeah. And there is that thing at the back of your mind that says, you know, I might not come back from this, but I've already made my, my peace with it. And part of making that peace with it is making sure that your family is safe and, and well provided for. And if there had been yeah. disruptions on that front, if there had been a major health issue, let's say with myself or one of the kids, and it would have made a huge difference for me to be there versus not being there, that's a risk I might not have taken. But that's a that's a different world. That's an alternate reality, not the reality that I've I've walked so far. I didn't have those impediments, and I I think that I think it's great. People always have to have a balance in all things. All things have to be a balance. And you do have to honor family and personal responsibility. You also have to honor yourself and the contribution that you have to make to the world and find a balance between those two things that works for you and works for everybody around you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and make sure that if you're going to take that risk, do all the homework in advance so that you're no longer just counting on luck and fear to get you through it, but also That's right. go into the consequence of it. If it goes badly, what's this going to mean for my spouse and my kids and my parents and everybody else? And, and, you know, how are, how are they going to be in a position to be able to deal with it? I, I went through all of that for each one of my space flights and I still consider it whenever I'm, I'm uh, thinking about something risky. Um, but at this stage, you've, as, as we just said, you just turned 66. Um, you're, you're, you're making, sequels to Avatar, Avatar 2 and 3 simultaneously. Let me just ask you a technical question. Um, I understand yep. you've been, uh, the, the, the motion capture is happening underwater from what I've been reading. And you've done a lot of that right. already, but now you're into all the production. So just quickly, what are some of the, the surprising challenges that have come from the, uh, you've spent a lot of your life doing things underwater, but what are some of the challenges you've learned trying to film these two sequels to Avatar? Well, just in general, whether it's photography or lighting or exploration or any form of technology, robotics, being underwater makes things 10 times as hard. It's definitely an order of magnitude. I mean, there's no real sort of math on this, but I've always assumed it was an order of magnitude more difficult. Um, and so performance capture, uh, which is the way in which we make the Avatar movies and bring these non-existent characters to life uh, in a photo real way through computer animation, um, is 10 times more difficult. So we made the first film, yeah. um, you know, starting back in 2005, took us four years to make. And we pioneered a lot of the, excuse me, a lot of the techniques of, of performance capture. And basically for people that aren't too familiar with that, we capture the body motion of the performer uh, in what we call a marker-based system. So there's about 100 or 200 cameras around the inside of the stage. Uh, and they, there are 
dot markers all over the person's body that are actually retroreflective uh, material. And so that, that creates a, a, um, a point cloud inside the computer that defines that person's motion. And so, and we can do up to 20 people now all at the same time wow. with extreme wow. accuracy down to probably about half centimeter accuracy for every bit. And it, it, it gets everything, every little twitch, every little detail, every little shoulder shrug, even, even your breathing cycle reads in wow. this. So we're able to reproduce the actor's physical performance extremely accurately later. The facial performance is captured a different way. We have a little kind of conformal helmet that sits on the person's head and there's a little boom. It looks almost like a concert microphone that, you know, Madonna might use in concert. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. 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 But it's not a microphone. It's a, it's a, it's actually two very tiny high resolution cameras that produce a stereo pair image of the face. And so we call the facial performance capture uh, image based, meaning it's based on that video that we take of the actor's face. And then there are all kinds of motion tracking algorithms and so on that sort that video out later and then assign a value to uh, every point on the face of the model because the model of the of the character's face because we don't we're not photographing the actor we're capturing their performance and applying it to a, a cg model with very very sophisticated algorithms for what we call muscle rigs and facial rigs and things like that and, so and now you're doing it underwater which which is just exactly yeah, yeah yeah thanks for bringing it back around but i figured i'd give people a base now we're going to try to do that <laughs> underwater yeah. So we, it turned out, it turned out that we, and it took us about two years to, to sort out how to do that. It turned out that, that all of wow. the capture, the cameras that capture the body motion, we had to work in an ultraviolet light system underneath the water and an infrared light system above the water. So it turned into, we had an upper capture volume and a lower capture volume and an interface between them with a little band gap of about two centimeters. And wow. so we were literally taking two data sets, one from above and one from below, to have somebody swim up, surface, talk, and then climb out of the water. Took us two years of technical development to merge those upper and lower volumes together because different light frequencies transmit through water than they do through air. So Jeez. that was just one example of what we had to go through. Another thing we had to do was we put small plastic balls all over the surface of the water because water becomes essentially a moving mirror and sure. it completely spoofed all of our capture cameras with false reflections of markers and things in the system and our, our noise canceling algorithms couldn't sort it out so we had to break the mirror with a floating uh, mat surface essentially that the actors could come and go through or dive into or the creatures could surface through and so on uh, that was safe for people to operate through, but that didn't right, right. allow the, the water to be a mirror. So that took a couple of years to figure out as well. Actually, it took so one split <laughs> second to think of, and then two years yeah. to apply. Sure. Is it, you know, two years, you, you keep mentioning not units of days or weeks or months, but years in order to do something that your viewing audience is just going to accept as as art and beautiful. You You must you must see movies so radically different than I see a movie. And, and the fact that uh -huh. you, you drew the idea for the, the tree of souls, you know, that, that, that dreamy mm -hmm. idea of that when you were a teenager and then you carried it through. But I've heard you say that, that uh, hope is not a strategy, but at the right. same time, I think it's so, so necessary in life. And, and I, I want to come back to, you know, the, the sort of the remainder of where we're headed here, but, what gives you hope right now, James? I think there are two things that give me hope. One is the human mind itself, our, our amazing curiosity, our amazing uh, ability to work together, to process complex problems. Uh, and the, the, you know, individuals can come up with, with ideas, but it's teams that execute our ability to function together. The excitement that we get working together on a problem, whether it's four guys trying to figure out how to get a truck out of a ditch, you know what I mean? Or yeah. uh, a team of 20,000 people at NASA trying to figure out how to build a space station. Um, 
it's we we love to solve problems we we love hard problems our minds are capable of it and the other thing that gives me hope is human empathy you know we we're we're these strange creatures we're programmed by you know a million years of of primate evolution to be highly aggressive to be competitive to be all the things that lead to war and, and lead to greed and lead to all the bad things in life but we're also programmed to be biologically programmed to be altruistic to do things for the good of others we're it's, and it's in our programming we, there's nothing we can do about it because if if human beings or or on the ladder to being human beings if when a baby was born and the mom and dad had to go do things the rest of the tribe ate the baby when they were gone didn't work out so well you know right. and so we the 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 price of our of our big brains is that we have a longer nurturing process and a lot of people haven't put the pieces together on this but i find it fascinating which is the human pelvis is what gets us around the planet we were walkers we moved we we migrated we went thousands of miles most animals live in a defined habitat human beings were the great adapters from the hottest deserts in africa to rainforests to moving into europe and uh in the and surviving and glaciation learning how to put on animal skins and use fire and all that. You know, we, we were walkers, we were movers, we were upright, we were bipedal. We could carry tools and surplus food and babies in our, in our hands while our, while our lower body did the propulsion, right? Great concept, but it's at exact yeah. odds to growing a bigger and bigger brain because there's only so, so big that the female pelvis can grow before it doesn't work anymore and you can't walk and keep up with the tribe. So nature was playing this balancing game. All right, here was the workaround, here was the hack. Let's grow the brain after it's outside the body. Great idea. How do you stay alive for that few years now that you're completely helpless? Well, you have to have strong societal bonds. You have to have a dad that sticks around and helps the mom. You have to have a group that allows that to happen. So it's built into our DNA more than probably any other animal on earth to cooperate and to have families and to have groups that support each other and to have these bonds. That's the thing that's gonna keep us alive. That mixed with the, the intelligence, the curiosity, the problem solving and the, the technology. And I wanna make sure we get to uh, Tylee to give her a chance to ask some questions, but perhaps the, uh, the most, um, important question that, that I wanted to ask you, and that is, it's right in line with what you just said, the, the application of the human mind to solve a problem, but also the heart and the empathy of people to, to solve a right. problem that needs to be solved for society. Um, you've, you've generated great wealth during your life, and I know that you and Susie have started a, a school, the Muse School, that is studying potentially into other countries from what the two of you have started, but you've been doing a lot yep. of other things to specifically address some of the issues, not just our little tribe trying to survive, you know, on the savanna of Africa and walking to a new location, but right. the, the entire species itself. And I'd really be interested to hear what you're putting your efforts into now beyond the, the magnificence of Avatar, what the other things that are important to you at this stage of life, James. I think our sustainability on the planet and a, a kind of um, a sustainability that works long term. A lot of people use that terminology to promote a, you know, a product, and it's usually it doesn't. It's not what I what I think of as deep sustainability. Deep sustainability is our ability to have a civilization that lets us do our our technology, lets us explore space, lets us understand the natural world, lets us celebrate the arts and literature and all the things that you know, are the virtues of the human mind without this constant degradation and destruction of the natural world to live vibrating in, in harmony with the natural world and understand, understand it better and respect it better. Because if we don't do that, th there won't be any deep sustainability. The hum human civilization won't look the way it looks right now. Uh, we won't have the shining accomplishments and we'll be in some highly degraded state and our the, the wonders of nature around us will be in a highly degraded state. So there's this 
intense desire to find life on other planets. Well, what we know so far is that there's there are not particularly great habitats elsewhere in the solar system, and we're having That's to look true. pretty far out in space to find something like an Earth. And even though they've found, I think, somewhere in the order of a couple thousand exoplanets around other star systems, they haven't found one yet that hits the sweet sort of Goldilocks spot that Earth does. And a, a planet as rich and diverse as we have might be exceedingly rare in the universe. There might be lots of planets out there, uh, and there may even be lots of uh, life out there, but the kind of richness and diversity that we have right here on Earth, we may not find for thousands of years, if it even exists at all. And there's no proof that it does. I just want to caution people. As much as I love science fiction, I love the idea that the galaxy is full of all kinds of interesting people. We have zero proof right now that there's any place anywhere in our universe that has the kind of beauty and, and biodiversity that we have right now. The wonders explode around us on a daily basis. And we've sort of channeled ourselves into a form of thinking that's about, you know, living in the suburbs or living in the city and driving a car and all these things that insulate us from that beauty, from that wonder, that wonder that can exist in the eye of a, of a snake or the feather of a bird. We don't see it enough, you know, and we don't, yeah. we don't honor it and protect it. And so to me, so I'm putting my energy into sustainability. And to me, that starts with food. There are a lot of people that are working on, on uh, renewable energy. And I figure there's so many people in that space. What a lot of people are missing is our food supply. We've got to have it. We've got to feed you know, coming up on 8 billion people. And the most, the highest degradation to the natural world is happening as a result of agriculture. Uh, it's what's polluting our, our oceans. It's what's polluting our rivers. It's what's destroying habitat. It's, it's what's slashing biodiversity and triggering these extinction events with, um, with all the, the various species on the planet. So I've been putting my money and my, my energy into agriculture and food supply and looking seriously at, at large scale or organic food production and um, uh, generating new cultivars and new genetics for legumes, which fix nitrogen in the ground. They're kind of self-fertilizing and they can even fertilize other crops in rotations, things like that. Things that the industrial agriculture system is not doing. I know people are always a little mystified when they hear this about you know, somebody who's an explorer and a filmmaker and doing these exciting, exotic things wants to be a farmer. If we don't get back to the earth and understand what soil is and what it does and how we grow our food and how we feed ourselves without destroying everything around us, then all of those other dreams are never going to happen. Our dreams of having an, a solar system scaled, uh, uh, you know, commerce or economy, that's not going to happen because we won't be around with the capabilities that we have now to do it for more than another century or so if we don't solve these problems. Some of the most important perspectives in life come from someone who's in a different place or a different stage of life. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Tylee Roberge. Uh, she is in just going into eighth grade and she lives on the other side of Canada from me, living in uh, Vancouver in British Columbia. It's great to see you. Hopefully you've had a chance to hear the two of us chat, but uh, did you have some questions for, for James Cameron? Yes, I did. Actually, this first one's for both of you. Um, James, you went to the bottom of the ocean, and Chris, you explored outer space. Would you both switch roles if given the chance? Hell yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm envious yeah. of James. Yeah, and I'm sure he'd love to do a spacewalk. Oh, yeah. I would love mm -hmm. to do a spacewalk. And That'd be so phenomenal. Yeah. And um, James, if you had to choose what is better for the human race, studying the deepest parts of the ocean or the far reaches of space, which one would you pick? I think I would pick the one that, that made the most sense for our survival um, as a species. And um, I think they're both important and it would be very hard to choose between them. I could make a case for both. The long-term survival of the species definitely depends on us understanding the ocean and its resources, but it also depends on us distributing ourselves off the planet and uh, because there are so many things that could take us out on a planetary level. Fortunately, they only come along every million years or so, 
Uh, yeah. But statistics doesn't doesn't protect you. It only gives you a, a sense of what might what is most likely to happen. So we need to get off the planet. We need to we need to be mining asteroids. We need to to uh, uh, be colonizing on uh, on Mars. We need to have a strong base on the moon. We had need to need to learn to live off the Earth and create our own micro ecosystems uh, and so on. We we we. We understand the problem, but we don't know the, the answers to those problems yet, the exact answers to those problems. So we need to do it. Okay. Um, I have another question. Um, I have a dream of one day starring on Broadway or maybe a big motion picture, but sometimes I think my dream is too ambitious and I might not make it. But um, you, James and Chris, you guys have such big dreams and you've both made it really really big, but um, do you have any advice on achieving those dreams, no matter how big they are? I think dreams are absolutely essential. You heard what James Cameron said, if it hadn't been for not only having dreams, but listening to them, so many of the wonderful things he's created wouldn't exist. Um, but dreaming isn't enough. You have to decide what out of your dreams is really important to you, important enough that you're willing to take a risk for it. And then once you've said, okay, this is worth taking a risk for, then it's not a matter of, oh, I'm worried about being on the stage or worried about being in a movie. It's like, okay, this is what I'm working towards now. It's fear isn't a problem. Now I just need to turn myself into someone who can actually do that thing that I'm dreaming of. But without the dream, um, you're just going to continue to stay the way you are right now. I'm really interested to hear what James says though. Oh, I was, it's, what you said is exactly true, Chris. I mean, you, you, it's everybody who ever accomplished anything of significance in the world had a dream and stuck to that dream. What they did was they turned that dream back on themselves as a challenge and used it to hone their skills. Doesn't matter how vividly you can picture yourself, you know, in a movie or in a situation or being an astronaut or being a sports figure, whatever it is. Um, doesn't matter how vivid that dream is. You have to be. You have to put yourself on the path toward making that happen. And if I ever wrote a book about the stuff that I that I do, and God forbid I do, because I'd rather just be doing it than writing a book about it, I would call it. I would call it making it happen, because it's not enough to dream about it. You have to make it happen. And the way you make it happen is that you prepare yourself. You prepare your mind. If you're a sports figure, you prepare your body. You train. Well, you can do the same thing with, with your mind, with your skills, with your ability. If you want to be a performer, learn to perform, learn to sing, learn to move, learn to express, learn to, to create a deep emotional channel into your own heart that you can, you can express outward to the world. Uh, these are skills. These, these aren't things that just people are. Yes, of course, you have to be born with it, but you also have to, to develop it. Right. And I think it's very important what Chris said. You have to pick because some people might have 10 dreams and spend their whole lives just nibbling around the edges of one or then the other and then the other and then the other and never deciding. You do have to go in a direction. I mean, there was a point in my life where I had to decide between science, technology and exploration on the one hand and the arts on the other hand. I decided because uh, my original um, uh, path in college was to be an astronomer or a physicist. And I studied that for a couple of years. And then I consciously chose to go into the arts and storytelling because I realized my gifts were, were greater there. I turned out I wasn't, uh, calculus was the boulder in the middle of my stream that I hit that caused me to go around one direction instead of the other. Otherwise I might, today I might be a, um, you know, an astrophysicist, who knows? So it's acknowledging where you're, where you're limited and where that limitation is going to prevent you from, a, from accomplishing one dream, but go into another one that you're more aligned to. So I went into the arts. I, I became an English major because I thought storytelling, maybe I'll be a writer, maybe I'll be a novelist, maybe I'll be a screenwriter. I didn't know, but I realized I wanted to tell stories. And that led me to ultimately to, to filmmaking. Now, curiously, I got, I got to double dip. I got to do a dual major in life, which is when I made enough money as a, as a filmmaker, I got to go be an explorer. <laughs> now, that was a bonus round. You make that get, and you don't know. It's okay to change your dreams, you know, if you find out, oh, it's not like I expected. But when you latch on to that dream that really suits what's in your heart of hearts, to me, it's almost like if you're body surfing or surfing, where there's that lovely feeling 
where you just start to catch the wave and you realize, wow, this, this is actually accelerating me along. This, this is, I'm part of something bigger than myself that is a thrill and I'm here because of my skill. And when you get that sense in your own life, boy, keep paddle in your hands, keep doing what you can to stay up with, with that motion. Cause, cause I'm sure James has felt it through his whole life. I sure have, and I still feel it now at this stage. And uh, don't be afraid to make a change in life. But boy, when, when, when you're getting that sense of momentum and excitement and thrill of, of really accomplishing something, uh, keep being that, that swimmer, that, that surfer. And make sure you, you ride it all the way through. Um, I have another question for you. Um, my friends and I are worried about the future of our planet and climate change. Um, what can us, um, our youth, do to help? Well, obviously, the... the one of the things that, and I should have answered Chris's question about hope. Um, my hope for the future lies in a generation that, that has all the facts that we didn't have in my generation. We didn't have all the facts about how we were destroying the planet. And your generation now has all the facts. And if you're paying attention to what's going on, uh, should feel a real sense of outrage um, uh, about how the planet's being run by old folks like us. Um, and you should, like Greta Thunberg, who's a, a great example, stand up and, and yell and scream and also make plans and take action to try to solve these problems. And climate change is just one of many, uh, uh, but probably one of the, the most important ones uh, to, that have to be dealt with. Uh, to basically save ourselves and save the natural living world around us. So that's a, a sort of a very broad statement. Yes, you have to take action. You have to get angry. You have to get in the streets. You have to make decisions. Your, your generation, young people rising up, but you also have to learn to live a certain way that's in harmony with the planet. And... So then people say, well, what can I do? What can I literally do? Should I buy a Prius? Do I remember to turn off my lights? That stuff is all important. The biggest single thing, well, the two things that you can do is be politically aware and vote for, for candidates that actually care about this stuff. And sometimes you gotta look around pretty hard to find them. Um, and the other thing that you can personally do is you can live um, with a lesser carbon footprint. And one of the easiest ways to do that, and nobody ever wants to hear this, but it's the truth, is don't eat meat. Don't eat meat and dairy. Because those, those products that we don't need to live, the human body doesn't require them, take about 10 times the amount of carbon due to like 10 times the amount of pollution. It's the wrong use of the planetary land that we devote to agriculture. We will never solve the food supply and agriculture problem on this planet with the number of people that we are burdening this planet with if we all try to live and eat the way we have historically done. We have, you know, some people call it, you know, vegan or a whole food plant-based diet. I call it the diet of the future. I call I, I don't I call myself a future vor. I'm eating the way people in the future must eat in order for the human race to survive. What do you think of that? Um, yeah. That's that's <laughs> <laughs> the, I don't know how I'm gonna stop eating meat because I love my hamburgers and my steaks, so it's that's really hard to change into, but if that can help our planet, I'm sure. <laughs> You can switch it up okay. a little bit. Well, why, don't, well, why don't you look it up? And because once you start to ask these questions, I mean, all the information's there online and you know how to find things online and find out information. So why don't you start, why don't you look it up and encourage your friends to look it up and see what the, you know, it takes, it takes 10 times as much land for the human race to live on a meat and dairy diet than it does to live. It's, I think of it as cutting out the middleman. Right, so we, we feed the plants to the animals and then we eat the animals. It's very, very inefficient. If we just eat the plants, we can live much more efficiently. We could even reforest about half of the agricultural land we're using right now and turn it back into habitat if we wanted to. So if we love animals, if we love rainforests, if we love the natural world, then this is, 
then it's very stark. It's very clear what we need to do. But it's a challenge, personal challenge. Yeah. Well, that's all my questions for today. But um, thank you both, James and Chris, so much for sharing your time with us today. It was really cool talking to you both. But um, now, yeah. James, if you ever find yourself needing a young girl in one of your Avatar movies, I look very good in blue. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we're talking about that young vegan actress that you're about to become? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Tylee, thank, thank you very much. Uh, that, that was a real provocative series of questions. Thanks. I think I have, I have one more question, James, uh, just before we get to the end of our time together. And that is uh, COVID has been a wicked thing for the world. Uh, it's been a global problem we've had to face. But to me, it's also been a little bit, uh, despite all the misery and loss of life, it's also been a test case for how we as a species can respond to a known global threat, whether it's an asteroid coming or whether it's the, the creeping change of climate that is, that is going to be so disruptive. What do you think of the way that we've responded as a species to COVID and how does that lead to uh, how we should maybe do things either the same or differently in the future? And how does that tie into Avatar? And then we'll be done. Well, look, you know, when the when the, the Apollo astronauts went out to the moon and looked back and they saw the, the world as being all one thing. And when you fly over it in low Earth orbit, as you've done many times, and see that there aren't any lines, it's not like a map where, where you know, somebody owns this part of it, somebody owns that part of it. It's all one thing. It's all one integrated thing. I think uh, COVID-19 has shown us how the human race is all one integrated organism and we're all cells within that organism. And the health of the individual has a direct effect on the, on the health of the organism. And it forces us to realize that the problems that, that are before us, the greatest problems that are before us are ones that require the greatest amount of international cooperation or global cooperation. And climate change is a perfect example, but pandemics are another example. And you can't help but look at the stark difference between how these problems are managed in different societies. Um, in, in New Zealand, where I am right now, they call, they, it's a population of 5 million people here. They call themselves the team of 5 million, and they think that way. And when they, when they get an outbreak, they all, they all download the app so that they can, they, they all know where they've been. So they're, un, they understand the need for tracking and, and, and contact tracing. And they were able to completely eradicate the virus once for over a hundred days. It's come back in and everybody's working together to get it stamped out um, uh, again. And you see this kind of community spirit. And then you look at the United States, which to me, I would put at literally the exact opposite end of the spectrum, uh, where it's done nothing but flare up all of the divisions in the country, all of the underlying uh, hate and fear of different groups of people. And you see that you see complete a completely chaotic response. And I can't help but imagine what it would be like if an asteroid was coming. I was going to hit square in the in the heart of Texas, and everybody just argued about who to believe and how it's all a, a hoax, and and it became politicized. And the people that believed that the asteroid was coming were aligned with one political party, and the people that that just thought it was uh, you know left wing conspiracy were in the other political party. It's like you know really this is how we're going to do it. Maybe we deserve extinction. If that, if the, if the U.S. is the example, we deserve extinction. Um, and I'm just calling it as I see it, because they just fragmented as much as you can, and and the response is horrific. And that's why they have the highest caseload per capita on the planet. And I've gotten to live within both of those societies over the last six months and see the stark contrast. So the point is, we as human beings have the capability to do these things the cultures that we create as humans may not. So we just have to be better. We just have to be better than we and are. If we're capable of building a, a spaceship crew or the huge team that you have to, to make the movies you've made, or even 5 million, a, a team of 5 million, then why can we not be a team of 8 billion? It's just a matter of culture uh, and self-awareness. Yeah, you beat me to it by seconds. Yeah, we have to be the team of 8 billion or we're not gonna make it.
James, just before you go, uh, you've been putting your your life where where your uh, where it is taken, and your money where your mouth is, and all that, uh, in a very um, respectable way. I think something that I can model after. But how about if uh, if you give me a challenge, so, something that's based on what you believe is important, and maybe something I can try and shift my own sense of norm a little bit based on your thoughts. What what would you challenge me with? What I would challenge you to do is to embrace a lifestyle of, of lesser use of, uh, of animal, animal products. And I've already explained the sustainability reasons for that that are quite profound, quite powerful. So I would, ch I would ask you to take a 21 day challenge to eat only plants. And I ask for 21 days because um, in that time, it reprograms your body, your internal biome, and you, uh, you the, the bacterial colonies that live within your body, and your tastes will change. And at that, that point, you can, you'll find out what your level might be. Maybe you go to a one meal a day kind of program, or you eat an entirely plant-based meal once a day as a, as a consciousness, uh, as an example of your consciousness around trying to improve the world. Um, maybe you decide that it's not so hard to, to, to live an entirely plant-based uh, lifestyle. So 21 days is, is a time. I think you'll, you'll find that it's uh, quite easy to do, um, that uh, there's nothing to fear but, but fear itself. Um, and then I would, I would say then build on that with your, with your viewership and with your, you know, with your Elevate program to uh, challenge some of your viewers to either, either try the one meal a day idea or to, to go whole hog for a short period of time. Even 10 days can make a, make a big difference. But I'm, I'm asking you, Colonel, to do a 21-day challenge and let me know how you do. Thank you for the challenge. I, I agree. One meal a day is easy and just try it for three weeks, especially here during COVID. You got a little more control over your daily life. So uh, thanks for the challenge. I'll, I'll do my best. And okay. next time I see you, I'll tell you how it went. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. I, I can't wait to find out. And if you need any help tracking down some, some tasty meat substitutes, so uh, my wife, Susie, and I have a, a long list. Great. Great. I'll be in touch. Thanks. Thanks a lot, James. Okay, great. This has been fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for watching. That was a very special uh, period of time with uh, James Cameron, a man like no one else on earth, uh, still continuing to inspire and lead us through his thoughts and actions. Thanks a lot, James. All right, Colonel. Good to see you.